All rise. Please be seated. Before we commence this afternoon, Mr. President, can I indicate that uh, this is clear Carlton Hansils has left us, so there hasn't been a change on this side of the room. All right, thank you. That, that's noted. Thank, thank you, Mr. Gervis. Not at all. <clears throat> now, Mr. Taylor, before the luncheon adjournment, we were talking about your political views, and you had earlier mentioned the succession of Tolbert as representing something of a crack, to quote you. And you also mentioned various other events which took place during the Talbot period, which impacted upon the ULA AA in the United States. <clears throat> so coming then to the Talbot years in more detail, did you see the succession of Talbot as representing a new phase in Liberian history? Yes, I did. Why? <clears throat> we, we have to look at uh, uh, the period. In, in fact, the normal uh, succession to power was uh, significant. Uh, but also, we, we knew uh, from Tarbell's uh, vast travels, his experience, uh, that in, 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 in simple English he could deliver the goods. So it did have an impact in knowing that he had the capacity. And was there anything about or anything done by Talbot in an, at an early stage which suggested that he might be seeking to heal the deep-rooted divisions between the Congo town set and the indigenous population? Yes. <clears throat> what was that? As I mentioned uh, to the judges before, uh, with my own family there was a problem in trying to intermarry. Uh, this is a similar situation that happened in the case of Talbot. Talbot did something very important. Talbot's sister uh, got married to an Aborigine Liberian. Uh, his sister got married to an original Liberian called Gabriel Fangalo. That's spelled F A R G A N G A L O. Now, in the Liberian setting, that's very serious for the sister of the president to marry uh, an aborigine Liberian that's that was unheard of that was a significant move in 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 my opinion and in the opinion of a lot of Liberians uh, that Talbot was trying to bridge the divide uh, this is what I consider significant and what impact did that have on individuals like you looking from abroad at Liberia? Well, it had a great impact. It, it had a great impact uh, <clears throat> in that uh, we, we saw this, again, as an opening. So, Torba's sister marries Fangalo. Great. Uh, may I just add, there's another thing about Torba that he went out of his way to do. Torba was one of the first presidents to, even though he was from the American Liberian stock, he learned to speak a local dialect. Uh, it's the Pele tribe. Now that can be spelled two ways. Some people call it Pele, K-P-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, or just P-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. 
uh, uh, these were all moves that uh, encouraged us and, and, and we saw in him this particular act you get married you speak the local dialect uh, he started talking about trying to to bridge the economic gap and what were some of his slogans he talked about mat to mattress you know and uh, total involvement for peace you know all these slogans and working toward them really uh, played a significant uh, part in our own determination uh, that uh, there was a, you know a move on to change and help us with this you'd mentioned earlier that President Tubman would on occasion have his speech vetted by someone at the US Embassy did that continue under Talbot? No no uh, Talbot, Talbot ran into some early problems uh, and, and, and problems it, with who? with the United States why? Um, <clears throat> Talbot broke what appeared to have been a long outstanding red line that he crossed. Torba was uh, during the Cold War the Soviet Union had a few embassies around Africa and it was almost uh, a sin uh, for Liberia uh, the principal almost and we assumed as being the principal ally of the United States in Africa to open a Soviet embassy in Monrovia. Torba did that and that, I think, is the straw that broke the camel's back. What do you mean? Well, not long after that, he was killed. What are you suggesting there, Mr. Taylor? Well, I, I, I do not want to speculate. I, 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 just, I can just give you the progression. Torba opens the Soviet embassy. It is disliked by a lot of people, including the United States, and rightly so, I want to believe, because of the close, uh, pro it, it, the close relationship. And, and if I can, can deal with that close relationship, uh, you mentioned before in your question the issue of VOA. There are long-standing ties between the United States and Liberia. Liberia is supposed to be America's little child. So, any the Soviet embassy is serious, but you got all these security posts. You have the VOA. The VOA is a radio station, but it's a relay station. And VOA we is what the voice Spread of for us. the voice of America is a radio uh, outfit that was used to relay radio communication across the world. But like the BBC, these are all propaganda uh, radio stations. Uh, that is in Liberia. There's another very important uh, security situation at the time. The other thing that is there, uh, Liberia is, I think, the only country on the African continent that is uh, hosting the uh, Omega, that's O-M-E-G-A, the Omega Towers. Now, what is the Omega Tower? Prior to these satellites that are the spy satellites that are launched into space that are used for navigation and other military purposes, the Omega Towers uh, were about three or not more than four across the world. These are very high, high towers. They are high security towers that were used uh, as guidance systems for uh, United States uh, uh, submarines and ships at sea. Very strategic. So Liberia became strategic to the United States in terms of uh, the VOA broadcasts and we now have the Omega Towers. Thirdly, Liberia from an uh, intelligence perspective is the center of almost Western intelligence on the African continent. So bringing the Soviet Union during the Cold War into Liberia was detrimental to Talbot. Now, what happens after that? A training program is conducted by the United States where uh, the first special forces are being trained. Samuel Doe, and Samuel Doe is the uh, former president of Liberia that staged the coup d'etat, are amongst the young men that train through this special program. 
immediately, and that was the, the, the best qualified training program that had ever been held in Liberia. Less than a month after this particular program, they killed President Tarba. Now, I'm not in a position to, to make any claim, but I'm just trying to give you the progression of things. The embassy, because of the close, the close relationship between these countries, this special training program, Tarba gets killed a month later. Is anybody's guess what happened? Now, earlier you made mention of some riots which had taken place in Liberia during the tenure of Talbot as president. Can you help us with the historical and contextual background to that, please? <clears throat> yes. Bacchus Matthews leaves the United States. He goes to Liberia and he begins the process of trying to start a political party. That struggle is on for several months. Eventually, uh, the party is permitted to register. It is called the Progressive People's Party, PPP. Which year is this? Uh, this is 1979. Thank you. Now, we are in the United States. We are following all of these occurrences in Liberia. I want to believe that had Talbot not wanted the Progressive People's Party to be registered, it would not have registered. We know as a fact that there were elements in the true Whig party that did not want change. Talbot wanted change. I'll be fair to him. I think as a maneuver on the part of Talbot's part, he permitted the party to register. And I think that may have been a signal to the, this block that did not want to see change that, hey, it's going to come. The party is registered, writes the staple of Liberia, becomes a major issue. Bacchus Matthews, very sharp, um, started talking about reducing the price of rice. And I must uh, not hesitate in saying that uh, to a price that I believe was impossible, but that's politics. Uh, he said that rice could be brought, brought to Liberia and sold for $9 a bag. Now, that was virtually impossible, but I think it was politics, and that's what he told the people. Talbot uh, raised the price of rice for another very good cause. Talbot believed that Liberia had to become self-sufficient. And using a basic, maybe economics 101, if you increase the price of rice and make it high enough that people can afford it and encourage domestic production, eventually we become self-sufficient. A very good reason too, which I agree with. But on the political side, Marcus Matthews sees this as an opportunity uh, to push Torba against the wall. A rice riot occurs people get killed. Uh, I hesitate to interrupt, but I think it's important uh, that this be noted on the transcript that the witness said rice riot. Oh, oh, excuse me. R-I-C-E. Rice, yeah, R-I-C-E. It's shown on the record as race riot. Uh, oh, I, I don't I, want I, that misunderstanding thank you, uh, being part of this trial. Thank you, Your Honor. I don't, I don't have uh, uh, the, uh, the stuff here, so I don't know. Okay, thank you, Anna. It's rice, R-I-C-E, the rice riot uh, occur, and people get killed on the streets of Morovia. Marcus Matthews and all of his people get arrested, thrown into jail, and charged with treason. Pause there. First of all, when in 1979 was this? Oh, this riot, this rice riot occurred. I'm, I'm still in the system. I think it's about April 
I think it was about April. Uh, and when you say that people were killed, who did the killing? It was said at the time that the police shot these peaceful, unarmed citizens. Now, uh, what is important about that, which uh, uh, Talbot denied this, of course the government denied it, but there were gunshot wounds uh, uh, that were on the bodies that uh, were recovered. Now, what most of us said, and I was in the United States Who's now. most of us? The Union, the most Liberians, but I'm speaking now as the chairman of the Union. The ULA, the, AA. Yeah, uh, well, I'm sorry, I keep saying Union. It's the ULAA. Okay, I'll, Thank you. I remember to add that. We say, fine, President Talbot, you say that the police were provoked and they killed some innocent people. Fine. If this is the case, there are two officials involved. In Liberia, the police comes under the Ministry of Justice, unlike other African countries where you may have them on the interior. Great. Fire the Minister of Justice and the Inspector General, we call it the Director of Police, and this would be an opportunity for us to begin to mend fence. Talbot refused to fire these two officials. And this exacerbated the problem, uh, and things just grew and grew and grew until they got out of uh, control. So, did you and your organization in the United States do anything in response to the rice riots? Oh yes, we did. What was that? We had demonstrations, uh, um, the Union of Liberian Associations in the Americas, ULAA, under my chairmanship, led demonstrations in Washington, D.C. We, we were so upset we bought a casket, and I personally led that demonstration to the White House in, uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, we had demonstrations in uh, New York. Uh, there was also another demonstration in Atlanta, Georgia. There were demonstrations and, and protests uh, staged by the Union. What was the response of the Talbot regime to the rice riots, if any? Yes, he, he did. There was, uh, besides these people being tried for treason, he tried to amend the laws, uh, the treason laws of Liberia, and this this would have caused these young men to have been executed if they had been found guilty. Now, you say they were demonstrations in Washington. What was the focus of that demonstration? We were calling for Talbot to step down. As you know, students in America, we said, "Look." No. This has happened, you don't want to act, step down, uh, and I hold elections. Uh, since uh, the uh, Progressive People's Party now is, a, is an opposition party, they may have an opportunity to win. You've lost the, uh, uh, the respect of the Liberian people, and it's time to step down. Was there a Liberian embassy in Washington at that time? Oh, definitely, and we, we did not hesitate to go to that embassy. Uh, uh, students, uh, we, we, we threatened to, uh, to burn it down, we threatened to take it over. We did not enter the embassy, uh, all trying to vent our anger at what uh, had happened in Monrovia. Now, what about New York? New York, as we all know, is the seat of the United Nations. You mentioned the demonstration in New York. What was the focus of the demonstration in New York? There were several. There were there were several demonstrations in New York, but the uh, the one that I think we we could focus on with more details is uh, the demonstration that occurred uh, when uh, President uh, Talbot uh, attended the uh, General Assembly meeting in uh, in Iran, August, September of 1979. Before we get to that, did Liberia have a representative of, at the United Nations at that time? Oh, definitely at all times. 
And who was the Liberian representative to the UN at that time? A councillor, Winston Tupman. And uh, after the Rice Riots, did he feature in any way in relation to ULAA activities? Did he feature? Did he, Winston Tubman, feature in any way? Uh, yes, uh, Winston came um, around the time that we actually uh, took over the consulate in New York. Uh, Winston, Which consulate? The Liberian consulate in New York. What do you mean you took it over? Well, we we had asked the president to resign. He did not. And we said that this is Liberia's property. Uh, we wanted to, uh, in fact, really to make a point. It was more of a point for the president. There was no destruction carried out at the embassy, but we decided that we will go in the embassy, uh, at, I mean, at the consulate, we will sit in there, stay in there, until President Torba responded to our demands. And how did things develop, if at all? Oh, they, <laughs> they, uh, they, they got a little hairy. Um, we go in, uh, we take over the, the consulate, no one is hurt, we don't break anything. Uh, Winston Tupman comes, uh, President Talbot hears of the whole incident and the Liberian government on the one hand is doing everything to hush this thing up because it was big press. They did not want that. So uh, Winston Tubman then uh, says to me, he said, well, listen, uh, you people have to leave the consulate. I said, well, we have no intention of leaving the consulate. He says, uh, well, if you people don't leave, and I must admit, uh, the Liberian government was, I mean, uh, Consulate Tubman, the ambassador, was not hostile. He said, well, please, if you people don't leave, we have to arrest you. I said, well, we want to be arrested. Arrest us. He said, no, we don't want to arrest you. We refused, and he contacted uh, Morovia again, and finally um, the New York City police were calling, and uh, about six of us were arrested. Were you arrested? I was arrested uh, and taken to the, uh, uh, the, the main police station in New York City. We were processed uh, and, then, uh, and then released on, on bail to, to appear in court at a later date. But the Liberian government, knowing that they did not want this publicity that we were really seeking, uh, decided that they did not want to press charges against us. And so they let us go. Uh, and Tarbot did this, I guess, as an attempt to demonstrate to us that he wanted uh, dialogue with us. And I think that was very generous of him. And tell me. Who was it that organized the demonstrations in Washington and New York at the consulate? Well, I'm not trying to beat my own drum. I was the chairman of the union. I, I along with the union, uh, organized the demonstration. Now, following that demonstration at the consulate, the Liberian consulate in New York, was there any other demonstration by the ULAA in New York? Uh, yes. Ayula uh, planned another uh, little trick. By Ayula, I mean the Union of Liberian Associations. Uh, President Talbot comes to the General Assembly. What and, for? Uh, to address the General Assembly. Uh, nation states, uh, once every year, come and address the General Assembly of the United Nations. And in what capacity was he coming at that time? Uh, twofold. Uh, he was uh, president of Liberia, but he was also chairman of the Organization of African Unity. And in what ca of those two capacities was he intending to address the United Nations? As president of the Republic of Liberia. Very well. So what happened? Help tell us. Uh, we, we were able to secure some tickets uh, for the, uh, the gallery of the General Assembly. And we bought these tickets, we got these tickets, and posted students at different points in the hall. And uh, as he would speak, we just uh, rudely 
uh, sadly disrupted his speech. We'll just jump up and yell and yell and grab this one, take him downstairs. There are cells downstairs in the UN building. There are jails down there. Uh, they'll grab this one, take him down. So we'll wait a few minutes. He starts to begin another two jump from the other end. Just, just disruption. And the new, the uh, UN police uh, finally managed to pick out all of the bad apples from in the hall and took us, it took them downstairs, locked them up for a little while, and then put them out of the building. Were you one of those arrested? No, no, I did not go in the hall, but I was in charge of it from outside. <clears throat> Did uh, President Talbot revisit the United States after that? Well, immediately following the General Assembly uh, 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 visit, he, he continued on to, where? Uh, to Washington, D.C. And did you have occasion to meet him at that stage? Yes. Help us with that, please. You know, having been through this situation myself as president, Talbot was in a very tight spot. Here's a man trying to demonstrate to us that he wanted dialogue. There's a large Liberian population in the United States, about 60, 70,000 individuals. And all of this is going on. He really wants to make peace. So what he suggests is that, uh, in fact, we asked to speak to him, and uh, gladly he accepted to meet with me and a delegation in Washington, D.C. at the Liberian Embassy, and we did take up the invitation and met with him at the Embassy compound. And were you there? I was there. I, I led the delegation. And did you address President Talbot? Yes. What about? I, I addressed him uh, uh, about uh, the need for change, uh, the unfortunate situation in Morovia where uh, peaceful citizens had been killed and his refusal to uh, to uh, discipline the the Minister of Justice and Director of Police and, uh, and, 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 and told him that we wanted to see meaningful change. His response uh, at that particular time was, was as follows. He said I am doing the best that I can to bring about change. You say it is slow, but I want change. You say, but look, some of you have been in America very long and may not have all of the details of what's going on in Liberia. So I now extend an invitation to you, Mr. Chairman, and a delegation to come and visit Liberia and tour the country where we think you will be better informed as to what is happening on the ground. And we accepted that invitation. Now pause there for a moment. Which year was this? This is in 1979. And in what year had you arrived in the United States? I arrived in the United States in 1972. So you'd been in the U.S. then for some seven years by then? Yes, without a vacation to Liberia. That is correct. And you had never returned to Liberia during that period? That is correct. So, would you agree that there was some force in what was said by President Tubman? Talbot. Tal Talbot, about you having become somewhat distant from events on the ground? Not quite. Not quite. Uh, there are about, like I said, 70,000 Liberians in the United States. They tell, wait, these, these, these Liberians, like all uh, of our citizens that are in the diaspora, there are hundreds and thousands of calls every day. There's virtually very little that you would not know. So while I agree that there may have been some internal political things that were going on that I did not know, but to a large extent we had a clear picture of what was going on because of the constant cross flow of information between Liberia and the United States. So he suggested then a tour. Who was going to fund and organize that? Now the government of Liberia. And did that occur? That did occur. We accepted the, uh, we accepted the, uh, the invitation. 
Who went on the tour? I led a, de I led a delegation of uh, four other persons. Who were they? By Bala, the president of the, of the, uh, of the Minnesota chapter. Pause. And just help us again, please, with that spelling. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's already on there. It's B A I G B A L A by okay. Bala. Who else? Uh, Nyon Due, that name a commoner. Stephen Joe and Joseph Gibro. So these were the other four members of my delegation. Was Tupay a member of the delegation? No, she was not. But in any event, when was it that this delegation left for Liberia? We arrived in Liberia in January of 1980. And <clears throat> was there a great deal of media interest in your visit oh yes oh yes um, <clears throat> the the union had developed his name uh, after the at least two or three uh, incidents that occurred let's not forget the first incident that I uh, we haven't gone into details, and I'm just going to touch it. Uh, attempts are made in Washington, D.C. to buy handguns. Uh, we are arrested by the FBI. That is news. We go to New York. We take over the consulate. That's news. We disrupt the General Assembly. That's news. We meet President Talbot in Washington, D.C. That's news. By now, Liberians have developed a deep sense of appreciation for the Union of Liberian Associations in America. In other words, these are our sons and daughters that went to the United States to go to school. They, have educate, they are educated now, so now they are acting in our behalf. So we, we, we have this, I don't know what you want to call it, uh, uh, almost rock star status, but uh, we are now looked at very seriously. So upon arriving in Liberia, we, there's big press, there's, there are crowds, everyone is looking. And, and, and may I just add before I, I stop, don't forget, there's the race riot, people are dead, and this is the whole period. A delegation coming from America is seen as a big deal. But pause there for a minute, Mr. Taylor. Um, assist us with this. Mm -hmm. Did it cross your mind that President Talbot might be luring you back to Liberia to kill you? Oh, yes. It did cross my mind. Surely it crossed our minds. Uh, here, here's a situation where we've embarrassed the man. Uh, we've disrupted his speech. We've done all of this stuff. We've called him bad names. And we're about to go to Liberia. Of course, it did cross our minds that uh, uh, we could, even if not get killed, we probably could have gotten locked up like the other guys that were already in jail. So why'd you but, go? Well, it was the, that was the, 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 the one thing, the, the chance that we had to take if, if we would have been taken seriously in any way as, as wanting to, to bring about meaningful change in Liberia. I mean, here we are. It's good and well to sit in the United States and demonstrate on the streets where at, at most the police will arrest you, take you in and book you and let you go. But now when it comes to the time to, to what we say uh, literally in Liberia, to show your juice and, and, and you run away, I mean, we just couldn't do that. So that was a chance that uh, uh, we had to take and, 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 and we took it. So what did the tour consist of? We get to Liberia, we uh, meet uh, the president. We ask to see those that are incarcerated. And by those that are incarcerated, I'm referring to Bacchus Matthews and all of the members of the Progressive People's Party. They are all incarcerated. We ask to see them. 
Uh, we do not get to see them. Why not? Uh, I guess for, you know, under the blanket of, of security reasons, a lot of things happen all around the world. Under security, uh, from the biggest country to the smallest one, they do all kinds of funny things under the guise of security. Uh, so they just said, for security reasons, uh, we cannot let you meet them. Uh, but the second phase of the tour was to go uh, to certain regions of the country and I was invited by the president it just happened that he was touring Nima County uh, where there had been some development projects uh, completed along with the United States uh, ambassador at the time I don't remember his first name but I know his ambassador Smith I remember him he's a guy he limped a little bit very nice man um, and he invited me to go along on that tour to see these projects and be a part of his delegation, and I went. And where in Nimba was that? Uh, we visited several towns. We went to uh, Tapita, we went to Butu, um, and also a, a project at the Baptist, there's a Baptist mission up there, another project uh, that uh, I just uh, forgot the name of the town, but there are about three or four spots, including Tapita and Butu. Help me with spellings for Tapita and Butu, please. Tapita, T A P P I T A, Tapita. And now uh, Butu is in the records, uh, but uh, it is, some people pronounce it uh, wrongly as Butu. It's not, it's Bu, it's G B U T U O, Butu. But in the records here, it may be spelled as Butu, but uh, it's about the same place. It's about the same place. And during the course of this tour, were you allowed to address the people in any way? Oh, definitely. I was not hindered in any way. I, I addressed uh, different groups. I held uh, press uh, conferences, and in fact, I uh, at one of those press conferences, I even had the opportunity to uh, to criticize the true Whig party at the time. Uh, I was free to operate in any way that I wanted to. He did not obstruct I me mean, in any way. And I did, I did address the press about an issue at the time. Uh, <clears throat> the Progressive People's Party before President Talbot went up to Nima County, I wanted to stage um, a peaceful demonstration in Monrovia. They were not granted the permit to demonstrate, and they did not demonstrate. <coughs> While President Talbot was on his trip in Tapita, the true Whig party staged a demonstration in Tapita. And so I immediately jumped on it and said that it was improper, uh, that if the Progressive People's Party could not be given the right to demonstrate, the True Whig Party should not be given the right to demonstrate either, uh, and that it was wrong for the True Whig Party to demonstrate. And you know, uh, Talbot was a little smart. He jumped on that and said that, uh, in fact, uh, he agreed, <laughs> I guess, very, you know, in a very uh, should we uh, eventually after the press jumped all over the he he agreed that uh, uh, they should have gotten a permit because in fact the demonstration had occurred without a permit and so Turbo seized the opportunity to criticize he, his own party and say oh uh, the, he just said the student from America is right uh, if 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 the if the progressive people's party did not uh, get a, 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 the permit to demonstrate and the true Whig Party did not get one, the true Whig Party should not have demonstrated. How, how old were you at this time, Mr. Taylor? Mm. Oh, we're talking about 1980, 48 to 80, uh, about 30, what, 32, 33? Oh. You're the one who used to teach mass. <laughs> For 48, 50, 60, 70, about 32. And how long were you in Liberia for? I was uh, in Liberia up until 
April of 1980. Having arrived when? January, late January. So whilst there, did a major event occur? Oh, yes. What was that? The coup of 1980, led by Master Sergeant Samuel Dole, occurred uh, while I was still in Liberia in 1980. How significant event, an event do you consider the Doku to be in the history of Liberia? Significant. Firstly, this was the first time in the history of Liberia that the President of the Republic had been killed in a coup d'etat. It was the first, in fact, coup d'etat in Liberia. It was the first time that we saw the entire system uprooted in an extremely violent uh, fashion. So it was significant. Now, just trace for us, please, as someone present in Liberia at the time, what you know about the origins of the coup and the way it played itself out. It played itself out. <clears throat> we arrive in Liberia. Uh, remember, there are individuals in prison. And may I just add, by this time, whether it was possible or not, the Progressive People's Party was being seen by a lot of Liberians as the possible savior. And I keep saying that it was impossible for them to do what they said they were going to do. Um, when when you look at that and you see the country is not solid. I mean, you, you can sense problems. There are securities posted all over the, the city, uh, mumbling here and there. It, 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 it had developed a gray complexion. Uh, by, I'm speaking figuratively now. I agree. Uh, you, you could sense that, the, the, that things were not normal. Now, I knew nothing of the coup. But on the, at the night of the coup, we, when I say we, Tupi and I, we at the hotel and we hear this gunfire. Pause for a moment. <laughs> How did Tupi happen to be in Liberia at that time? Well, Tupi is my fiance, and um, I'm going to Liberia for some time, and and she and we just planned that uh, we should be together. So she took off at that time to be in Liberia with me. Okay. The hotel manager informs me that uh, uh, this is about late, late morning, about four or five o'clock in the morning. That uh, pause again. Date, please. Uh, this is uh, April six, uh, nineteen eighty. You sure about the date, Mr. Taylor? I'm sure. April twelve. April twelve. April twelve. April twelve. April twelve. Thank you. April 12. Uh, there's another set of shooting in Morovia, April 6th, during our time. Just, I'm sorry, but it's, it's April 12. We get up, and by this time, the announcement has been made that night that uh, the army has taken over. The hotel manager informs me that there are soldiers downstairs to see me. 
She said, what do you mean soldiers here to see me? He said, well, there are some soldiers downstairs to see me. The soldiers could not enter because when the firing started, the, uh, in some of these countries they have, uh, uh, they are rolling steel doors, but they fold and they open up and down. So you, you, you can look through them, but you cannot really go through. These are steel, I don't know, steel shutters, I, may, I think they may be. Um, so I come down, and the soldiers tell me, the general wants to see you. What general? They say, the commanding general. So what does he want to see me for? Say, well, the general just asks us to come and take you to the barracks. Now I'm scared, because I think now they're they about to arrest me. Uh, one of the fellows that came to the hotel to call me, uh, in fact, two of them started speaking the Gil language. Now, Tupi, my fiancé, is half Kra and half Gil. She speaks Gil. So she understands what they are saying, and she jumps in and begins to speak to them in the Gil language. And they say to her, apparently, what she is meant to be in Gil, no, it's okay, uh, this man is, is one of the student leaders and the general wants to see to him. So then Tupi says to me, oh, Charles says, okay, let's go, it's all right. So I asked the, the, the hotel manager to open the gate. He gives me his Jeep and we drive to the barracks. <coughs> we get to the barracks, we're taken straight into the commanding general's office. I get in there, I see a young man sitting behind the desk with some other individuals, and this young man happened to be the famous General Thomas Kuiwongpa. Pause there. Let me just ask you about one or two details before we come to that initial meet, that meeting with Thomas Kuiwongpa. Which hotel was it that you were staying in at the time? Uh, we were in the, the Holiday Inn Hotel. And you told us earlier that you'd heard that a coup had taken place and the military had taken over. That's correct. How did you come by that in information? The hotel manager. The hotel manager came up and told us, say, oh, there's a coup d'etat. The soldiers have taken over. So by the time the soldiers come now, I already know there's a coup. Mm -hmm. And so I'm frightened because uh, you, they don't know me, I don't know them, they come for me. I have not been in Liberia for years, so I had to take precaution. Now, before I come to the, your meeting with Kwiwamka mm -hmm. on the morning of the 12th, what details do you know about the actual events surrounding the coup and the killing of Talbot? Well, I only get to know this following our meetings and subsequent uh, conversations with General Kuwongpa. Um, very strangely, on the tour in Nima County, in fact, let me just digress a little bit. The soldiers that staged the coup d'etat against President Talbot are all or mostly bodyguards of President Talbot. How many of them? Uh, the, uh, the council totals about 17, but they grew up to 20. And tell us, that group of 20 bodyguards, did they have anything in particular in common in terms of their very recent experience? Oh, they were all a part of that special military training program that had been conducted at uh, Camp Todi, T-O-D-E-E, -E -E, by the American Special Forces. And how long before the coup had that training ended? Oh, not very long, less than a month, almost immediately, almost immediately. And you were telling us about the tour in Nimba County when I interrupted you. What were you telling us? Well, I, I did explain that in Nimba County we visited these development projects. I have spoken about the, the press conference in Nimba County 
uh, where the demonstration uh, took place and it was criticized. Um, but that's about the end of the tour and then we returned to Moravia. Hmm. But I was asking you initially, what do you, did you in fact discover as to how and what occurred in relation to Talbot himself? Well, let me see if I, if I, if I can get on that track. Um, let me explain to you some of the things that happened. Maybe this may come to your question. While in Limba, there's an incident in the hall where uh, the Minister of Interior of Liberia, uh, Dr. Kessley, that's K-E-S-S-E-L-E-Y, is involved in a very heated discussion with the member of the National Legislature of Liberia. Uh, he is very, very rude uh, to this gentleman. I'm standing a few feet away and I'm hearing the conversation. So I walk over to him and I say, well, Dr. Kessley, I say, I am shocked. The president invited me here to see and guess what? I have seen. You are a minister of government and you are insulting a member of the legislature. I said, this is outrageous. I have seen enough. And I walked away. But in that hall are the bodyguards that I'm referring to that are securing the president. They are all there and most of them hear this exchange. So you're brought before Kriwamka. Where is this? This is at the Barclay Training Center, BTC, B-A-R-C-L-A-Y, uh, training, normal training center in Monrovia, is the uh, military headquarters for the brigade uh, of the Armed Forces of Liberia. I'm taken into him, and uh, I meet him behind the desk with several other uh, not knowing at the time several other officers, but these officers happened to have been uh, members of the group that had just carried out the coup. They are sitting in the office with him. And what were you feeling at the time, Mr. Taylor, when you were brought before these military <laughs> men, knowing that a military coup had taken place just hours beforehand? Well, my... My fear had been greatly reduced by virtue of my fiancé telling me in the first instant that it was okay. So that's a relief for me in the first instance. Uh, but in all fairness, there's still that little part of me that is saying, okay, well, you know, because we're never too sure. But there was some assurance at that particular point. Uh, and when we get into the office, uh, the first thing the general says, oh, Taylor, I said, yes, General. He said, sit down, let's work. By this point, I am relaxed because I know I'm not in trouble. He said, sit down, let's work. And what is said? Then what brings a little more, I, I, if, if it's anything, I think I begin to sweat at this particular time. The guys that are sitting there with the General say to me, do you remember us? I said, no. Then they said, when you were speaking to Minister Kessely about what he had done to the representative, we were the security standing there. And another guy said, remember the press conference that you held when you criticized the True Week Party for the demonstration? We were all there. And because we know that you have come and you want to be fair, uh, this is why we've called you down to work. By this time, really, it, it brings fear in me because then I begin to say, but my God, what if I had said or done something wrong, I would have been in deep trouble. But by the grace of Almighty God, I had stayed above board, and I, that, that was my saving grace. What else was said to you at that time, if anything? Well, the... Uh, they said to me that uh, we needed to, uh, to uh, work and try to secure the uh, revolution and that uh, 
this had had happened uh, to try to bring change in the country and that uh, the time for the Congo people was over and it was time for the quote-unquote country people to uh, take over the country. Now, apart from yourself and the military personnel you've described, was there anybody else present in that room? Yes, there were, there were individuals uh, present, but not, not in a very comfortable way. By this time, the armed forces had uh, commenced uh, the arrest of uh, ministers and senior officials of government. Uh, in fact, in that office at that time, on the floor, was the Speaker of the House of Representatives and other ministers of government that had been arrested. Were, what do you mean on the floor? They were tied in a very uncomfortable position, lying on the floor. Now, at this stage, had there been any kind of announcement over the public media by anyone as to what had gone on behind the coup? Yes, uh, they, uh, they had announced the coup. They had announced that the, uh, the president, uh, Talbot, had been killed along with uh, a couple of members of his family and that uh, uh, a government uh, styled the People's Redemption Council was now in control under the stewardship of uh, Master Sergeant Samuel Kanyon Doe. And was any indication given as to how the country was now to be governed? Well, not exactly. Uh, they, 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 they did say that uh, the, the country will be governed by decree, but that's not as specific enough. It was just uh, the early days, what they sought to do, just say, we've taken over, we want change, and uh, we will set up the council, the council will set up the name, the officials of the council, and say that they would, they suspended the constitution, and that they would rule by decree. And uh, what was the mood in Monrovia like at that time? Very, very, very joyous mood. Um, Let's, let's, let's not forget that uh, this old Congo country situation in Liberia uh, has festered. Here is the coup by a group of non-commissioned officers that are quote-unquote belonging to which group that's what I'm coming to they, they are all uh, so-called country people and so the, the the majority of the Liberian population until today may rank about 75 25 percent that is 25 percent American Liberian and uh, maybe I would even I'll put it maybe 20 percent and about the vast majority the uh, the uh, Aborigines Liberian so what we saw at that particular time were the the festive activities of uh, of those that of of the uh, the Aborigines that really embraced this coup d'état. Was it purely festive? Well, no, no, no. Festive on that part because we had what revenge killings going on. We had looting. We had total disorder. Total disorder. Now, effectively, then. If I understand what you've told us correctly, Kwiwampa was offering you the opportunity to work with the coup makers. That is correct. What was your response? Oh, I accept it. Why? There are several reasons. <clears throat> One, We would have wanted, we, and let me clarify we, I'm talking about uh, the union, I'm still the chairman of the union, but there were other very progressive groups in Liberia. And while I don't claim to speak for them, but the general view was that a non-violent change is what we wanted. But, having seeing the coup take place, I 
saw this, and strangely, some of uh, these progressives that I'm talking about, uh, later on, I am told, saw it the same way. We saw it as an opportunity to finally get control and move the country into the direction that we wanted to. Our plan, my plan, looking at it at that particular time was that, look, here are young NCOs. Uh, Tamil school Wangpa was, uh, I think, the best educated amongst all of them. I think he had reached the 11th grade. Uh, the rest of them were below the 9th grade level. Uh, where we could embrace them, nurture them, and encourage them to return to the barracks. So we saw it as an opportunity to do that and begin to work and bring about this long change that we had wanted to do for a long time. This was an opportunity. Uh, and these were our thoughts. But strangely, it didn't come out all the same way. So let's just pursue that a little further, shall we? When, in terms of that grand plan that the progressives had, the soldiers returned to the barracks, who was going to take power? Well, we were trying to get them back to the barracks, have elections, democratic elections, and let the best man win. This was the whole thought at the time. And who did you fancy to be the best man at the time? Well, I was sure to throw my hat into the race. Uh, that was sure. Uh, of course, I would think I was the best. Uh, others thought that they were the best, so, but I would still think that uh, I would have thrown my hat in the race at the time. Now, help me. When you met with those military men, did they explain why they were coming to you for assistance? Well, no. After these guys uh, uh, told me that they had heard me, and they were present in the hall. They, they, they had. I mean, excuse me, Arnold. So, uh, I'm sorry. I don't know if I'm offending you. I, I talk with my hands, so I hope this is not. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. Not, not at all. Mr. Okay, because I normally used to. Okay, very good. We have these uh, people hearing me. They, they, they know what I have said. Okay. They, uh, so they are in a position uh, where uh, I, I, I guess they have their own plans, but you know, our plans just didn't work. So, at that early stage, at that meeting, was your advice or assistance sought in any particular respect? Yes. In fact, I volunteered. I volunteered. And once he said to me, sit down, let's work, uh, the first thing I asked him is, uh, uh, I said, General, uh, what are you people doing about securing, firstly, this revolution that you people have put into place? And secondly, I said to him, as I'm driving here, the, there is total chaos on the streets. I said to him, I said, you guys are going to have to do whatever you can as soon as possible to get these soldiers off the streets because the diplomatic community will begin to complain. They are, they were, there were hundreds of citizens outside of the barracks uh, 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 crying because their houses have been taken over, looting. And, and it was embarrassing to me, as I'm coming into the barracks gate, uh, some of these people see me, they already know that we're in town. Oh, Taylor, 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 uh, they, they, you know, we are dying, oh, we are dying, oh, we are, you know. And, and so I get in there and I tell them, I say, listen, the first thing we've got to do here is to, is to secure this revolution by getting these soldiers off the street and gaining some credibility with the diplomatic community. If not, you guys are going to be in trouble. Because by this time, there are several countries, Ivory Coast, Guinea, and I think Nigeria are very concerned. Don't forget 
the man that just got killed is the chairman of the OAU in addition to being president of Liberia. So yes, the chairman of the OAU being killed in a military coup by a young officers. So there are already threatening remarks being made on international radios. And that uh, coupled with that, La Côte d'Ivoire, that had been a very peaceful country, the daughter, or at least the goddaughter of the president of La Côte d'Ivoire, Daisy, is married to President Talbot's son. She is not found. La Côte d'Ivoire is threatening. So there's a big problem from these threats. And I'm saying to him, you got to get these soldiers off the street. You got to try to call the diplomatic community to explain to them what this whole coup is all about. If not, you're going to be in trouble because people were talking about trying to put the force together to come because one news story was that Tauber was not dead. And some people were saying, that's the OAU chairman, we're going, in, we're going to go in and, you know, and rescue him. So my advice to them was to begin to move urgently to calm things down. And was there any specific suggestion that you made to yes. them in order to achieve that purpose? The first thing I did was to ask for uh, two of the most senior security personnel in the country that were incarcerated at the time to be released uh, to do a plan of action. One of them is still alive today. He's uh, Edward Sumo Jones, a very, very trained security personnel that had worked with all the major security agencies almost on the planet. Pause, help us with the spelling, please. Edward, as number Edward Sumo, S-U-M-O, and Jones as in Jones, J-O-N-E-S. And the second individual? The second individual was a gentleman called T-Boy, T-Boy Nelson, and that's T, uh, like just T, and I think it's B-O-I, not like B-O-I, boy. It, it's a crude name, T-Boy Nelson. He was the head of the National Security Agency of the Republic of Liberia. Uh, an agency that uh, had tentacles uh, far and wide, and he was incarcerated. I said to him, well, look, the first thing you need to do is release these two men to me. He released them to me. We sat down immediately and drew up a, a security plan of action uh, to be taken to the then chairman, Samuel Canyon Do. And did you take it to Do? Yes. Kui Wangpa. Uh, took me into the mansion. I uh, met with uh, with Master Sergeant Do. I uh, then spoke to him about the plan, and immediately he called the Minister of State uh, to look at the plan and uh, uh, for it to be sent to the appropriate areas. Now, let me just tell the judges: the Minister of State. First of all, uh, Your Honours. By the morning of the coup, all of the progressive leaders, the Moja leaders, the Barkos Matthews, are all the new ministers. Barkos Matthews becomes foreign minister. One of the progressives, Dr. George Boley, that's B-O-L-E-Y, who is a Kra, he has a PhD in education, is the Minister of State and Personal Assistance to do. He's also incarcerated and is released from prison on the morning of the coup. Dr. Tokbana Tipote, another progressive, was made the Minister of Planning. Dr. Henry Boema Famule, another, please. Uh, Fambule, F-A-H-N-B-U-L-L-E-H. And let's, we need help with the first name, please. Tukba now Tipote. No, no, Fambule, first name? Henry, as in Henry, H-E-N-R-Y, Henry. Thank you. Henry Boima, B-O-I-M-A, Henry Boima Fambule. Uh, Dr. Togba Nan Tipote, T O G B A Togba dash N A H. Togba Nan is one, is one word, one name. Tipote is uh, T I 
I'm not sure if it's one P, but I think it's T I P O T E H. Tipote. Uh, he has a doctorate degree in economics. He becomes the Minister of Planning. Dr. Henry Boyman Fambole becomes the Minister of Education. Uh, so, uh, some of the other uh, leaders that are released from jail, like Oscar Kuya, becomes the Minister of Interior. Now, back to the point, Dr. Bole is called immediately and said, well, here's a plan, Bole reads it, and he says, well, get to the Foreign Minister immediately. So, Bacchus Matthews is contacted, and the plan is revealed to them and is accepted for implementation. That is, calling in the diplomatic community, and trying to allay the fears out there about the chaotic situation that had developed. Now, oh. following the meeting with Kriwampa, you told us that a plan of action had been put together, mm -hmm. which was to be submitted to Doe. Did you go to see Doe? Yes. That same day? I went along with Kriwampa, told Doe, was present when Doe called Bole and instructed Bole to take the plan and call the foreign minister to begin to work out trying to implement whatever parts they wanted to. Tell me, had you met Kwiwampa before that day? Never. I did not know any of What them. about Doe? Had you met him before? Not at all. Not at all. Now, <clears throat> these other individuals, the various doctors you mentioned who were brought into the government, mm -hmm. did you have any prior relationship with them? We all knew each other. I knew them all very well. They were Moja, Marxist, Leninist oriented. Uh, we knew each other. We did not see what I would say, so to speak, eye to eye in terms of ideology. Uh, but I guess we respected each other. And you were 32 years old at the time. How old was Kwiwampa? Uh, Kwiwampa should have been some, uh, I would say, at least 10 years younger. These were very young boys. I think the oldest one at the time was 27. Who was that? Uh, I think Do and Kuangpa uh, was about 22, 23. These were young boys, young mm. men. Now, I want to pause for a minute so that you can help us with some of these personalities behind the coup. First of all, Kuangpa. How significant was he? This, this young man was extraordinarily brilliant. Um, I am told by him that they, he was one of the principal organizers of the coup d'etat. Now, as they brought individuals in, in fact, Kurumba should have been the leader of the revolution. But as they called people in, and they, they were all friends, Do was called in and other people, and According to military ranks, Doe became the leader because he was the highest ranking NCO as the master sergeant. That's how he became the leader. But what they did was there was a vice head of state, there was a speaker, there was a secretary general. But the compromise with Kurumpa, who was the next highest in NCO rank, he was given this position of commanding general where in reality, other than Do, Kuwampa was the most powerful man in the revolution. And what did you think of him as an individual? You know, sometimes I was amazed at how a young man who did not have any real formal education could have been so smart and very caring. Uh, this, 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 this man was caring. Uh, he was 
out there trying to stop the excesses of the army. He, I mean, people, military people were being disciplined. Uh, he sent out troops to rescue uh, citizens that were in trouble. Uh, I mean, you know, you, you would think that someone needed uh, at least a university education, but he understood these. He was well trained, very, very decent, caring young man for his age. I was, I was really, really impressed. Is the witness describing Do or Ku? General Ku Wampa. That was your question, Counsel, wasn't it? Yes, it was my question. Yes, and what rank was Kwiwamka at that time after the coup? Um, Kwiwamka became a brigadier general, commanding general of the armed forces. A brigadier. And who was, in your estimation, the most influential individual in the coup? I still say it's Kuwampa. And what about thereafter? Thereafter also. He he gained he gained the respect. It, it did not take very long before the the citizenry I realized that uh that a Kuwampa was the uh the real man. Uh, uh, let me just interject. Uh, when the coup occurred, in addition to these arrests, one of the first things that they did was who did? All, uh, the, the coup leaders, all senior officers of the armed forces of Liberia were also arrested. That is all the way up. The chief of staff of the armed forces of Liberia, at the time Liberia, was one single brigade of, a very small brigade, of about 7,000 men. And now uh, the, the, the chief of staff of the armed forces of Liberia carried the rank of lieutenant general. Now, here we are, the coup occurs, everyone is arrested from the chief of staff down, and an order is published by the coup leaders that no officer before the morning of the coup, uh, that no soldier should take any instructions or orders from any officer. So in fact, the armed forces now is destroyed. There's no chain of command. They are not, everyone is virtually now below the rank of, of, uh, of, of, of master sergeant. But as a member of the council uh, in the military, and I'm sure there are military people on the other side that know this, what to say, what assignment sometimes can be greater than rank, but rank prevailed. Um, the armed forces commander now becomes a brigadier, Thomas Krumpa, with the rank of, of general, but no other soldier in the armed forces is given a rank. So everybody is below the rank of sergeant. Okay? The coup cool leaders do not have to worry about it because now they are the bosses. So they don't have to worry about rank anymore because everybody else is saluting them. So this is the structure. It's good to... It's good to get this picture. Now, how did the general populace regard Kwiwampa? Oh, they honored him. They, they liked him. He was fair and, and, and reasonable. So everyone wanted to get to him to carry their problems. When there were problems, they wanted to see Kwiwampa. I mean, he was just uh, loaded with problems. And this is why I, had to, I stayed in the barracks with him for about three months because I couldn't rest. Okay, so I was one of the one, I was the only progressive that stayed in the barracks with him in helping with the day-to-day, -day, what I would call putting out the little fires. Uh, this thing, I'm um, sending soldiers, go this place, do this. I stayed with him for three months. Now, that's Kwiwamka. Can you now please give us a little pen portrait of Master Sergeant Doe? I really did not uh, know Doe very well or interact with Doe a whole lot. Uh, Doe knew all about my mission to Liberia uh, with the rest of the, uh, the members of the council and, the, uh, and they respected me. As they went into the barracks uh, every day, you know, soldiers apparently like barracks conditions. 
every member of the council except for Du and other people, they were in and out of the of the of the barracks. And so I got to know and meet all of them. I would say within the first 48 hours, because they were all coming in uh, to the barracks, because you know there was very serious fear at the time. There was another officer of the armed forces of Liberia at the time, a major by the name of Jebo, that's J-E-B-B-O. Jebo commanded another unit of the armed forces that was a respectable unit. And when the coup occurred, there were rumors that Jebo did not back the coup and would stage a counter. So everybody was running in and out of the barracks, uh, consulting with the general, you know, and trying to uh, secure what they had just put together. And so what they started doing immediately was arresting those other individuals from that elite unit that were commanded by Major Jebel. So uh, because of this frequency in the barracks, I got to meet most of them almost immediately. Mm. But Doe, what kind of a person was he? Yes, I did not know Doe very well. Very quiet man. Didn't speak a whole lot. Uh, shrewd. Educated? No. Uh, Kuangba had uh, a higher education than Doe. I think Doe did not go beyond the ninth grade. Did, could you talk to Doe? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, the, the, the respect that I commanded as being the leader of the quote unquote for them, the students in America was very high, so I could speak to Doe. If I wanted to see him at any time, he saw me. Did you think he was going to stay in power as the leader? Quite frankly, um, my impression was that uh, these uh, men would have not stayed there a very long time. My impression of Doe was that uh, that Doe, you know, had this brought upon him because, like I said, Doe was not in the first little batch that started planning. He was brought in. And so, so who I, started the planning? Uh, Kuangpa. Kuangpa started the planning. And so he did not appear to me to be someone that would want to stay on uh, a very long, uh, but it turned out differently. Now, following the coup, who was the vice head of state? Uh, the vice head of state was a general called, a gentleman called Tamons, it's regular Tamons, Wei, W E A H. Wei Seng, S E N G, Tamos Wei Seng. Is that one word? Uh, let me see, it's a crew in here. I think it's uh, Wei Seng, I think it's, it's one word, Wei Seng. And who was he apart from being vice head of state? Tamos Wei Seng was uh, one of these very, very low educated but smart street smart uh, who uh, previously had joined the progressive people's party he was a member of the of the ppp one of these uh, uh firebrands and And did he remain around f for any period of time after the coup? Oh, no. Uh, we're saying uh, ended up, uh, along with other members of the council, he was executed by Samedo. How long after the coup? Oh, that uh, was within the first year. I would say uh, uh, the first year of the coup from April, uh, I would say about a year. He was he was he was executed. Why? <clears throat> Remember I stated to this court that the Russian not Russian, the Soviet embassy had been opened in Liberia. Yes. I 
As Minister of Education, Dr. Fambule and a group gathered some individuals and sent them to Ethiopia at the time of the leadership of Majustu Hari Marien. Now, don't ask me to spell that. You have, I don't know. But I know it's called Majustu. Uh, he overthrew the, the emperor of Ethiopia, Majustu Hari Marien. Don't worry, Mr. Taylor. <laughs> Thank Mr. you. And you will look it up on the internet. Very good. The, these individuals should have been sent there to uh, do literacy training. But to our greater surprise, the CIA informed us that they had been sent there uh, to do military training uh, to come back and overthrow the government of Liberia. Now, uh, and maybe somebody will say, but why would the CIA have any, any interest? Uh, the, 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 the security agencies of Liberia work with intelligence agencies around the world. And so information flowing uh, will come. Maybe people don't know that, but this is the way it works. Uh, and we were glad that we were informed because it was true because again, uh, I, and I don't blame the United States because the United States, rightly so, would not have wanted uh, for this to occur because those individuals that were planning to stage this counter coup were the Marxist Leninists and dealing with Magistu with the Soviet Embassy in Morovia uh, that was a cup of tea. Even I, if I, it, I was glad that we had the opportunity and we, and it was stopped. So, though immediately ordered those people back, most of them did not return. Now, where it's saying was a regular visitor to the Soviet embassy in Moravia, and they were advocating some extreme Marxist views that some of us did not support. So when it was confirmed that there was supposed to be this, remember now, the Cold War style situation about to take place, where here are people going for training, they're about to come from this Marxist uh, Magistu, and the, the, member, this, the most senior second member of the council is, is a regular visitor to the Soviet embassy, uh, this was something that none of us could take. And so, uh, Wei Sen was arrested. Was he put on trial? He was put on trial, uh, and he was found guilty. Of what? Of treason. And what was done to him? Executed. Now, when was it that the CIA, you say, informed you of this? Uh, they informed... Uh, 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 the government immediately uh, before the West and arrest. Immediately mm. before the West and arrest. Now, previously, Mr. Taylor, you appeared to be hinting it to us of some kind of American involvement in the coup. Uh, which coup? Now, the second the coup? The coup. <laughs> well, I, I, I did say, Council, that I'm in no position to, to be emphatic about that. I just said, I, I, I will explain the different circumstances uh, and then one can draw their own judgment. But what I do know is that uh, following this coup that Doe planned, we began almost immediately to, to, to be seen favorably by the United States. I was in the barracks and uh, the chief of U.S. military mission uh, at the United States Embassy in Moravia was, uh, I mean, almost took up offices at the barracks. So, Who I guess, that? oh Christ, I, I I couldn't remember the gentleman's name. Very well. Uh, Carry on. But uh, we we appreciated that because one of the things that we did not want to happen. We did not want to lose contact with the United States, uh, in all frankness. And I think it was, it was proper uh, that we, we dealt with them. I spoke to this gentleman so many times, even diplomats came, 
I would sit in the meetings and and you know and express the the desires of, of, of what these young men wanted because in the language that the diplomatic community could understand and I think uh, and even when you look at the gesture on the part of the United States government in trying during that Cold War era in trying to prevent a Marxist Leninist revolution in Liberia especially with key United States installations in Liberia I think uh, it was it was something that uh, uh, some of us really supported, and I did. And tell me, when you first arrived at the barracks, summoned by Kwiwampa, did you see anything to confirm that suspicion? That? At the barracks. Are we suspicion? The suspicion about American involvement. Well, I, I'll put it this way. If you just got through training uh, these new people, the instructors are still in town. Of course, uh, you know the instructors and everybody. Uh, there's no hostility at this particular time between uh, the armed forces of Liberia and uh, and and the, and the American trainers or the American embassy. There's no there's no problem. So getting in and out of uh, the barracks, uh, in fact, was not a problem. In fact, I think it was encouraged because. Uh, Everyone knew, I knew, if, if, if the United States, and, and, and let's be very frank about this, if the United States had come down hard against Doe and this coup, uh, it, it would not have sustained itself. And, and, what, and what do I mean by come down hard? If the United States had said, hell no, we are not going to permit this, you are going, it would have taken a few months, but uh, I think it would have happened. But now we are talking about the Cold War era, and we are talking about we are talking about interests. So I I I see here that uh, the 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 whole approach in coming in, uh, I guess they were trying to make sure that whatever had happened, uh, that there will be a smooth landing, and that sooner or later uh, all the chaos will stop, and and then the next thing that will come about will be they encouraging the army to return to barracks. Mm. Now. You've already told us that President Talbot was killed. Mm -hmm. Where and how was he killed? President Talbot was killed on the eighth floor of the executive mansion. Now, I, I know that place because I lived up there myself. Um, <clears throat> uh, what General Kuangpa and the main killer of Talbot explained, it was a young man that actually shot him. The, 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 the presidential, the eighth floor is the family living floor of the president. It is very, very secured. All of the glasses up there are bulletproof glasses. The doors are sealed. So when the president enters, there's the living room, the, his bedroom, his wife's bedroom, the entire area, once the president, once he enters, it is secured. I'm told by John Kuomba after uh, the, the firing started, and quite frankly, it's a very sad scenario. Most of the, the soldiers at the, at the presidency that were guiding the president fled uh, because their friends were staging a coup. They were all together, so they just didn't budge. They go upstairs and they actually have to knock on the president's door after he had apparently called around the different stations no one answered. He got up, got dressed, because the body of Talbot, Talbot was still dressed, fully dressed in a white suit. Uh, he got up, got dressed. They knocked on the door, they kept knocking on the door, and he opened the door, because they could not get him. Like I say, they, that area is secured. Uh, you cannot enter unless the president inside opens the door. And the first gentleman, I am told by Kurumba, there's a young man called the late Nelson Toe, uh, open T O E Nelson, like in N E L S O N. The uh, last name is Toe, like in T O E. He fired the first shot to be followed by others, including a gentleman called Harrison. That's H A R R I S O N. Penu. 
And now that pin I think is P E and I stand corrected on this N U E, if I'm not mistaken, Penu. He's also crown. Uh then he he was the second, but I am told by General Kwong that the original first shot was fired by a young man called Nelson To, a very fiery young man who uh, ended up getting executed with we're saying too because of his fiery behavior. Now, was Talbot the only individual in that administration who met such a brutal fate? No, uh, following the killing of Talbot, uh, several members of the government were executed. How long after the coup was that, Mr. Taylor? I would say not more than three weeks. The, the council decided that they had to uh, do something to demonstrate to the world that they were serious and that uh, uh, to set an example, as they put it, and uh, they executed uh, several uh, officers. How many? Uh, if I'm not mistaken, there could have been as many as 17. And where were they executed? Uh, right on the beach outside of the barracks. The Barclay Training Center in Monrovia is located on the beach. And uh, I would say from the uh, the office of the commanding general to where the execution took place maybe maybe 500 meters uh, 500 to 1,000 meters uh, where the execution took place. Did you observe it? I did. What impact, if any, did it have on you? I had never seen anybody killed. Uh, I had seen dead bodies before, in, as in normal death. It was a, it was a very uh, a chilling experience uh, for me. I stood on the balcony of the commanding general's office and looked over uh, to where it, uh, the execution occurred. Did you know personally any of those who were executed? I knew all of them. I knew all of them. Uh, uh, some of them uh, better than others. Uh, the speaker and others that were executed, like I say, were personal friends of my, of my father. Um, the the um, the president pro temp of the Senate uh, by the name of Frank Talbot. I had dated uh, a daughter of his and visited his his home uh, many many times uh, as a young man. And um, there was a very good friend of mine, a uh, personal friend of mine, by the name of John John like in J O H N. Sherman, uh, he was the Minister of, of Commerce. Uh, the rest of the ministers, I, I knew them very well. So were you party to the decision to execute them? Uh, really, we were party to a decision to help reduce the number of people that they really wanted to execute. They. Uh, I remember one evening I'm sitting down and General Kuwampa returns from uh, the from a council meeting. And mind you, council, which council? The PRC. What does that stand for? People's Redemption Council meeting. What's that? That's the junta that took over in Liberia. We are sitting and he comes and he's very sad. Uh, these meetings were held without anyone being invited in the beginning. Only those that staged the coup d'etat were permitted. He came very sad and he, he called me, he said, Taylor, the, uh, the chairman, Chairman Do has decided with the council that uh, we should execute some people. I said, what? He said, yes. He said, the people are, you know, this is almost like Liberian English, the people are plenty. I said, what do you mean? So. I say about how many? He say, oh, it could be almost 200. I say, no, 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 no. I say, Thomas, 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 this, this cannot happen. And uh, I got to know subsequently that other individuals, other, other progressive individuals, have also heard this about a day later and were also pleading to say, you can't do this. We fought, at least I fought for my end, 
uh, to tell him that it was not that Torbo's death was sufficient, but they insisted that some people had to go because this would show that the old system had been totally uprooted. And so they finally settled all these few. Now, did you agree with that sentiment? That in order, in effect, to secure the fruits of the revolution, these people had to be killed. Did you agree with that? No, I did not agree with that. I said that uh, it, was, it was bad enough for Talbot to be killed as president when they could have saved him, but that it would just be terrible in the eyes of the international community to begin to line people up on the beach and execute them where they were not being put on trial. There was not a trial where we're going to try you before military tribunal, none of that stuff. They just decided these were the so-called Congo people that caused the trouble. They have to go. I was opposed to that. So help us please, Mr. Taylor. So we have this situation. Among those condemned to death, are family, friends, people you've known. Mm -hmm. You disagree with this brutal decision to cut the tie with the past. Mm -hmm. So why didn't you in turn cut your ties with the Doe regime? Good question. Well, look. That's why I asked. <laughs> there, are, there are several reasons. Look, number one, it would not have made any difference if I did what? But number two, even more important, number two, we would have lost, or I would have lost an opportunity to bring about the meaningful change that we were trying to construct to bring about. Pulling out, imagine, all of the progressives in Liberia are on board. I have an opportunity, and it has been realized I'm in the system, I'm respected, I speak freely to all of them. Pulling out would have been maybe a, a, a very glorious act to do, but I believe at that particular time it would have been a stupid thing to do because Charles Taylor alone wanting to pull out and return to the United States would not have meant anything because everybody else was on board and I felt that my staying in there would also give me an opportunity to be meaningful in what I saw as the way forward for Liberia. In any event, the executions take place. Yes. And to your mind, what effect did those executions have so far as the legitimacy of the Doe regime is concerned? Oh, it, it, it really, it really did not help. Uh, after the executions, uh, most of the uh, Western countries and donor agencies and different things frowned on the, the whole process. And this really intensified the anti-activities uh, uh, on the part of the, the international community uh, toward the Doe government. And what about the general population in Liberia? What sense did you have of their reaction to this event? When you look at the percentages that I gave you before and, and you look at the the underlying problems of Liberia between a miracle Liberian and Aborigines, uh, the vast majority of the population that uh, uh, were the uh, Aborigines uh, were happy and wouldn't care less. And in fact, uh, I would say uh, probably wanted more to go. People saw this as, as this opportunity to at last vent this anger over the years that these people came they, they they've overlooked us they've, they've they've treated us like slaves in in our own country to be frank people were happy 
and I would say in the majority. Can I pause for a minute, Mr. President, and assist with a spelling from earlier? Mengistu, M-E-N-G-I-S-T-U, Haile, H-A-I-L-E, Mariam, M-A-R-I-A-M. <clears throat> Now, after you first arrived, Mr. Taylor, at the barracks, BTC, help us, how long did you remain there? I was in the barracks uh, for about three months. When you say you were in the barracks for about three months, did you physically sleep and eat there? Oh, yes. Uh, I, well... That question, physically, sleep and eat there. Many times I slept and eat there. I still maintain my place at the hood. I did not move lock, stock, and barrel into the barracks. But I would say I can just help by extending some percentages. I would say I spent, as of that time, about 70% of my time at the barracks. Doing what? Oh, working, receiving complaints, talking to diplomats, uh, um, getting matters to the general, dispatching people to put out uh, troubles where people are, the soldiers are misbehaving, looting people's properties, all kinds of problems. I just stayed there and, you know, trying to get things back on even keel uh, in far, in, in as, in as far as getting the soldiers back to barracks. Because one of the things that I really was interested in, and let me tell you what I mean by barracks. I'm not just talking about the Barclay Training Center in Morovia. By the time this coup occurs, soldiers from all military bases across the country, instead of remaining at their bases and waiting for others, everyone is moving to Moravia. So you've got everyone coming. So they, and they, they see this now as, this is, in fact, one expression used at that time was, this is our time. This is our time. And so, trying to get people to go back to your go back to your station, helping to get logistics arranged in terms of transportation to to uh, turn them back. Imagine at this particular time, the international airport is closed. Trying to get things, just getting it cranked up. Don't forget, these are young men that are just coming to power. Know nothing about governance know nothing about international relations, know absolutely nothing. And they are now depending on us, this, this whole progressive group to come and help them steer uh, uh, the country back to normalcy. So uh, I'm there with him because most of the other progressive are at the ministries and dealing with other members of the council. Jerome Kuangpa in the barracks has no one there to help him. And so I stay there to carry, help him carry out these functions. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mr. Griffiths, I, I don't necessarily want you to discontinue now, but uh, if you could finish a little early because we've got that other matter from yesterday to deal with as well. Frankly, Mr. President, that point is as good a point as any. All right, thank you. Well, uh, Mr. Taylor, if you'll... Your, your evidence uh, today is finished with for today, but uh, if you'll be good enough to just sit there, uh, we'll deal with the matter that was raised yesterday. Uh, it's not a big matter, but uh, yesterday the <coughs> Defence Council applied on behalf of the accused for the trial chamber to uh, limit the uh, accused's uh, time in the witness box to uh, four days per week instead of the usual four and a half days which the court normally sits. At present the uh, court sits only one half day on Fridays uh, devoting the other half of the day to uh, other duties. Uh, in coming to uh, this decision, uh, we've considered the views of both parties regarding the application. Uh, we understand that uh, Mr. Taylor's evidence 
is going to be lengthy, extending over several weeks and possibly even longer, uh, allowing for cross-examination. Uh, Mr. Taylor uh, obviously anticipates that uh, testifying over such a long period will uh, subject him to strain and pressure, uh, and he wants the extra half day on Friday uh, enabled him, to enable him to uh, recuperate from the, the evidence he's given uh, during that week. Uh, the court uh, appreciates his concerns. The, the court sits quite long hours each day as it is. Over the course of several weeks, um, the accused being, exam uh, being examined day after day can prove uh, quite a stressful ordeal. We, we therefore uh, grant uh, Mr. Taylor's application. During the course of his testimony, the court will not sit the one half day it usually sits on Fridays, but instead will sit uh, Monday to Thursdays only. The sitting hours per day will remain the same, and this decision applies only to Mr. Taylor and not to any other defence witness. Further, the court may decide to sit on a Friday of any particular week if time is lost on another day of that week during Mr. Taylor's testimony. Well, uh, I'm most grateful, yeah. Your Honours. Thank you, Mr. Gribbs. Well, the, the only other matter um, is something uh, that, uh, frankly, we, we didn't uh, anticipate, uh, probably should have, in view of the status conference, and that is the caution to be given to this witness. And uh, what uh, the court uh, is aware of that uh, under Article 17, the, the witness has certain uh, guaranteed rights uh, to communicate with counsel, and I don't think uh, the prosecution disagree with that. Uh, I think the prosecution, though, uh, in, in recognising the rights under Article 17, uh, uh, are of the view that uh, communications between uh, counsel and the accused, while the accused is giving evidence, uh, would, would be subject to cross-examination uh, to the extent of uh, examining whether the accused has been coached in any way. And uh, I think the, uh, the case on that which we don't have today is the uh, Appeals Chamber decision in the ICTY case of Prillage. Um, which did firstly anticipate that uh, opposing counsel would be able to cross-examine, but secondly, uh, <coughs> laying down that there, there is a presumption, a rebuttable presumption, of bona fides when counsel deals with his witness while the witness is giving evidence. Now, as I say, we don't have the... Uh, case before us, and, and frankly, we don't have um, any um, submissions from either counsel on the uh, applicable ju uh, jurisprudence. But it seems to me that uh, bearing in mind uh, the guaranteed rights of the accused under um, Article 17, that it would be a sufficient caution if, if the normal caution is administered. And, and that caution is simply that uh, Mr. Mr. Taylor uh, is warned not to discuss the evidence he's giving with any other person, and that would be subject to Article 17. Now, is there going to be any disagreement uh, amongst counsel on that direction? Not from our side of the court, Mr. <laughs> President. And I, I might add, uh, I've just been handed Prilich's case, and obviously I, I don't have time to go through it now, but I think you will find that the appeals chamber in Coolidge did contemplate cross-examination, but limited to uh, irregularities in the contact. In any, in any event, do, do you have any... Th I, I, I gather that Mr. Um, 
Griffiths has no, no objection to that direction. Mr. President, I guess in the, in the uh, course of cross-examination, we will further understand the qualification you have seemingly applied to our cross-examination on this matter. So well, at this well, point, we have no Well, possibly I can explain question. it now. Uh, the, the defense, while Mr. Taylor is giving evidence, would always have a right to communicate w with the accused. It doesn't mean that they're communicating with, uh, about the evidence he's given or is giving. Uh, it means that they have a right to communicate. Uh, if, on the other hand, uh, and, and I would consider that evidence, to, uh, whatever they communicate that does not bear on the evidence he's giving, it would be privileged. But, evident, but obviously, he would, the accused would be open to cross-examination on accusations that he's been coached. Uh, and you could ask him questions along those lines. That, that's what I meant, uh, Ms. Hollis. We understand that the scope of that would include asking him if indeed he did speak to counsel, how many counsel, how long, and then putting the questions relevant to matters that deal with his testimony in court. Well, as I uh, mentioned at the status conference, I think every instance of this um, must be looked at uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. But uh, what, what, uh, uh, the thing we're asking at the moment is, do you have any objection to that caution we've given Mr. Taylor? And if you do, uh, in what way would you uh, suggest it be altered? We have no objection to the caution. Well, that, that will be the uh, caution given at the end of every day then. Uh, it'll be, simply be a caution that Mr. Taylor not discuss uh, the evidence he is giving with any other person, but of course that caution will be read in the light of the, his rights under Article 17. Thank you. Now, if, uh, if any specific case uh, arises, you can make a, a formal, a formal uh, application uh, supported by your submissions on the uh, uh, existing jurisprudence. Thank you. Well, we'll, we'll address, uh, we'll uh, adjourn now until uh, 9.30 tomorrow morning. All rise.